mentioned it in the show. I did two things new. One was I gave Ron permission to choose a piece of music, and he would play it, and I would improvise my body movement from it into a story that I didn't know what it was going to become. And it became a story, some of you remember. It was an African story on a boat and alligators. And So that was new, to just turn myself over to the unknown. And the other thing that was new was I read a Rumi poem. And when I finished that, when I finished reading it, I let myself improvise how it touched me and tell a story. And what I found, number one, it's really marvelous for an artist, a performing artist or any kind of artist, to find inspiration because we're always looking for how to create and what to create from. And it's suddenly really exciting to me to have a source of creation based in Rumi because I can do this now for a long time. I can read something and interpret it as the body wants to and my heart wants to. And um, for those of you that didn't see it, I'm just going to review it for you because I've told a couple other people and they go, oh, I love that, it's great. So, um, so the, the statement is, and it's applicable also to our own journey spiritually, and conferences and everything else. To expound and propagate concepts is simple. To expound and propagate concepts is simple. To drop all concepts is difficult and rare. So you can see how it challenges the egoic mind to say, wait, 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 let me have one. You know, I'll let go of them all, really, I will, except, you know, my belief about letting go of concepts, you know. So, what a thank you. I'm glad you've got that there. So, what I would like to do is tell you what that was, that experience, to expound and propagate concepts, right, and to let them, to, to drop them all is difficult and rare. So, for those of you who didn't see, and just to give you a little glimpse, this is what I did in silence. A little bit off camera, I can't go too far that way because I get off camera, but a little bit over was...
Thank you. Thank you. So that happened in its own way. I didn't know what it was going to do when I read Someone came up to me the next morning at breakfast, and I was eating, and he said, David, oh my God, you were so courageous. And I thought, yeah, in a way, that's true. And I said, why, why would that be interpreted as courageous? Obviously, doing something that you're not familiar with or stepping into the unknown. But there's nothing that I've done all of my life as a teacher or working with people one-on-one -on -one or as a performer where I haven't felt like whatever I'm saying I desire for it to have reason or resonance. I don't like just talking for my sake. It's kind of, it just doesn't fulfill me. So even my words as I'm speaking right now, I'm waiting and listening and hearing inside. What's relevant when I look in eyes? What wants to be said to remember connection and somehow inspire a recognition of oneness? So I thought, what is courageousness? Okay. I got it. This body's been around a long time. I've taught it to, to be isolated. I can do almost anything with it. You know, it can, it's, it's capable of speaking. It has a language to it. But it's familiar. So, me stepping on stage with a, with a trained form, body, vehicle, makes me feel, I'm fine with it. Right? And Rumi inspires me. So I got Rumi and a trained body. Not a big problem for me. I actually loved it. 300 people looking at me. And I walk on going, I don't know. But isn't it kind of fun? I want to ask you a question. I've never asked an audience this. Isn't it kind of fun you knowing that I don't know and we're about to find out together? Isn't there something about that? That's the unknown if the teacher also doesn't know. I can share concepts with you, etc. So with this in mind, he said, we were talking about this, so I felt courageous because my body's familiar to me, it's trained, it's ready, so that was easy. But how do I translate that into something that's valuable to us living in everyday life? You don't have a mime-trained body, unless you want to let me know and I'd love to watch you perform for a minute. But what is it that you have that would actually give you a sense of courage or confidence in your daily life? Similarly, as a parallel to my performance on stage. And he and I were talking about that, and you know what came up? Not only the consciousness of who you are, but the translation of that, as I'm going to use in this moment, is your heart. Your heart doesn't need rehearsal. And by that I mean not just to be poetic for fun, but lovingness of yourself and life, even if you're having a hard time, the presence of lovingness doesn't need rehearsal. It already knows what to do. But we got this. Things between us and just being open in life. Like I was open on stage. So my invitation to you is, and the talk is about my book called The Ocean of Now, and it's in the bookstores, is the ocean of now is unknown as a fact anyway. So as you look out of your eyes right now at me, and it appears that I am a teacher or a speaker, and you're a listener, and you're going to learn from my talk, I'm going to ask you something right now. Experiment and actually drop this veil between you and me as if I have anything more than you. And I mean this literally. Try this as an experiment. First, let's go the other way. I like games. So first, look at me through your eyes as if I have something really important and profound to teach you. Okay? Seriously, look through your eyes and feel that. Okay? Oh, David Elsey. Oh, it's the performer. <gasps> right? So really look at it and feel what it feels like to look from that. Okay? So anyway, I was talking and yesterday looked through those eyes like that. Be aware, what does it feel like in the body? You don't know as much as I do. <laughs> What's the feeling? I would like to hear some participation. What's the feeling to you of looking out, thinking someone else has something to give you that you don't have yet? Yes. Smallness, good. Anything else? Thank you. 
Anticipation, great, waiting for the moment, right? What else? Attentiveness? Contraction? Hunger? Hunger? Yeah, good. Expectation, good. Awe, good. In your excitement in your chest, yes. Open, good. Great, great. So there's nothing wrong or right about any of the answers. This is your self-discovery. So that's the experience of believing that there's someone that has something to give you. Now, please understand, with all honor and respect, knowledge comes in every form. So there may be something that comes through here that resonates with you, like the C string in a, in a piano resonates other C strings even though you're not touching them. That's what I believe is happening here. I might be saying something that resonates your C string, so to speak. Better than G string, I was sorry. I didn't even go there until he chuckled. And then I, you bad boy. It's okay. Yes, yes, the, great idea. So this idea of resonance is what I'm talking about. I'm not giving you anything. And how could I give you anything? How could I give you anything if consciousness is the totality of this room, if it's looking at itself? In fact, Nisargadatta once said, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't remember it per word, but it was something like consciousness in two, appearing as two, but only one, and wanting to connect is love. So this one desire for connection is the one just enjoying connection with itself. So it appears that you're learning from me, and I hope you do. I hope there's something. But what I'm really asking of you is something kind of new, and especially if you're here the rest of the conference, explore this. What I'm going to finish this little section with is I'd like to ask you to take back anything you're giving me in terms of power right now. Right? Literally. Now, I'm, I'm asking you, again, not philosophically, because I don't like to talk in an abstract. Now look at me through those eyes with a sense of whole completeness, fullness, emptiness, spaciousness, unbound. Actually, whatever words, it's irrelevant, the words, but just look without the sense of needing something from me. And what is that sensation like? What's that like? Joy. Joy. Good, thank you. What? Presence, friendship, friendship. friendship. openness, relaxation. relaxation. Soft. What? Soft. Soft. Freedom. Receptive freedom. Great. So you. Great. Great hair type. Haircut. Haircut. Thank you. Yeah, this one I cut this afternoon. Thank you. Oh, stop it. I love you. Yeah. Completeness. Great. So, so isn't this fascinating? Isn't this fascinating? We did nothing. But you shifted a cell, an unconscious wall. You thought you were looking through this filter that said, David has something. I'm not com quite complete. He'll give me something. I'll be done. I'll be complete, and I'll be whole, and David's incredible. <coughs> Maybe you didn't go that far. <laughs> I did. <coughs> but but I, I present that to you because... Really, think about this, dearest friends. Seriously, think about this. Here we are, 20, 30 of us, walking around. We'll walk out that door, and you may forget what happened in here. But if you remember, remember that within 60 seconds, you changed your sense experience of life to completeness, wholeness, freedom, relaxation, friendship. That was done inside your being. Right? That's how powerful awareness consciousness is, depending on where you place its attention. If it's unconscious attention, you get contraction. If it's expansive openness, you look through your eyes with something else. And that's why I really love that exercise, because there's nothing unique about it. I just asked you to look through your eyes with a different awareness for a second. That's it. You're done. That was it. That was the exercise. So you can stand. Hi. Tell me your name. Matt, would you stand up here for a second? I could be, I, don't, I haven't met Matt before, maybe seen you around up in the lobby or something. But I can look at Matt right now with my choice. Okay, I can look at him and feel a little bit separate. Not sure about him. Nice guy, 
you know, good blue shirt. Matt, thank you very much. Nice blue eyes. But I can feel sensorially a different experience. It almost makes me want to cry because it's kind of scary. But if I shift for a second, and, he, and he, here's the thing. This is so funny. And listen carefully because this is, for me, it's a very important difference. I'm not asking you to think positively or do affirmations or replace the filter with a new filter. Right? Everybody clear? I'm not asking you to put something else in so that you become something else. I call it the great disappearance. That's the change of life to me. So I'm not going to try to look positively at him now like, hmm. Right? There's effort. If I actually just do this, so I'm looking through him with a little bit of fear, he's separate from me, and if I've, I'm not doing anything else but looking without fear. My whole field, my biomagnetic field right now is a wonderful feeling. You too. All right, so there's no fear, there's no, okay, now I'm going to work at being different, you know? It's the great disappearance. So we don't have to become, thank you, appreciate it very much. We don't have to, you got applause, man. Don't, whenever they applause, don't lose that chance. You got to bow. I'll, I'll teach you later. I have a lot to teach. So I just, you know, in this moment, the reason the book was titled The Ocean of Now is that without this, this is an ocean of possibility. And you can feel it without saying, I'm going to make this happen. Now, regarding life, the, the full title of this is The Ocean of Now, How to Navigate the Unsured or the Challenging Times. Something like, I don't know. <laughs> Who wrote this book? It's really long, this title. How to Navigate the Unsured. And this is so funny. I have friends that go, you look so funny when you do this. <laughs> <How to laughs> and I feel funny, too. And I how to navigate, it's my own book, that's funnier. How to navigate the unsure waters of our challenging times with courage and peace. So, and then there's, there's like five major principles I address in here, which I'll just share with you briefly. But the principle, the main principle is how do we translate this open eye awareness, this unbound, unlimited, non-limited, non-filtered as much as possible. So that becomes to me the spiritual journey. It's not to be enlightened and fixed. It's to be awake to what's unconsciously causing you to see differently than you, your heart wants to. And as you drop that each time, you see clear. And another one comes, you drop that, and you see clarity. So when I'm working with people one-on-one -on -one through divorce or financial challenges or health challenges or simply on a seeking path, on a spiritual journey, basically all I'm doing is saying they're speaking, but they speak through the filter also. You know, this is my situation. And my job is to be an investigator, to be... To be, um, all I can think of is Peter Sellers, um, Monsieur Clouseau. Ah, no, no, it's really, right? I help them see a filter. And then I have some processes that help dissolve the filter so that they see more clearly. And then they can look at a decision about a marriage or a divorce or going forward or asking someone to marry them. Or, so as I look at each of you right now, the 30 of you are so here. What I would say to you from my heart in the position of standing up here as an equal is that I see within each of you a unique, gorgeous, powerful, gentle, compassionate, troubled, journeying presence of the absolute, which is none of those things. So that's the journey for me, this integration between the absolute and day-to-day -day living. So one of the eye tests is you can use this idea of dropping to be more present in your daily life, grounded in your own two feet. That's really how I talk to my clients a lot right now is how does it feel to be without that? And a lot of people say, well, rooted, grounded, more present. Because think about speaking from your heart if you're just here. You know, I'm challenged. So if you're my dad and I said, I need to tell you something. When you used to hit me, it almost destroyed the rest of my life. And I'm an adult now. 
and I just need to tell you, I understand. I can't really love right now, but I want you to understand that I know, I understand the pain that I know you grew up in. That's all I can really say today, you know. So we'll talk again sometime, okay? Isn't that different than you freaking why? Why would you, you know, what happens in your body when I do that, right? Immediately, right? You shut. So do you see it's hard, it's challenging because we have all of the emotional, it's like this, we walk through life going, oh, 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 no, I'm really good, I'm great, everything's good. We got our baggage, luggage. If I were to ask you this question, what is an emotion that you're really familiar with, with that you would like to be free of today if you could? Right? Just call them out. Doubt, what? Anxiety. Doubt. Anxiety. anxiety. Fear. Fear. Foolishness. Foolishness. Impatience. Impatience. Great. So I'm going to ask you all to be mimes with me for a second. You didn't know you were getting this, did you? I'm going to ask you to do something with me. Put your hand like this. Okay. And just for fun, I wouldn't normally do this, but why not? I'm, this is great. I'm loving you guys. Um, the way that you do the wall, watch for a second. Right? The way that the illusion appears real is that there's an opposition. The hand is relaxed, and then it's tense. That's how the eye sees uh, um, polarity that gives appearance. That's, this is all the same, by the way. Wall, no wall, black, white, open, closed. This is all, that's how this appears. So now we're going to do it again. So one, one side and another. Now, I want you to think right now about your greatest feeling that you'd like to be free of. I'm not good enough, I'm too old, too young. Okay, and just hold your hands up like this for a minute. Okay. Now if you would do me the favor, I'd like you to close your eyes and let yourself feel that feeling to the degree that you can. Now, what if I said to you that if you don't lower your hands, and I'll keep them up, but if you don't lower your hands, you will have to hold on to that feeling and let it drive your life for the rest of your, li your, your days until you die. Keep your hands up. I know. Now keep them up. I'm, this is an exercise, right? But feel what happens if you have to hold this the rest of your life. There's nobody else holding this wall up. So now, here's the, here's the invitation with your eyes closed. Notice how it feels, the effort, the work. This is the wall between you and the ocean of life. Take a gentle breath. Relax the shoulders, the upper arms, lower arms, and allow the hands to begin to come down. And as you do, imagine allowing the feeling to dissolve as well, just as an experiment. You are no longer holding that up. There was nobody else doing it for you. And therefore, you're the only one that can put it down. Let's take another gentle breath, please. And can you be open to this possibility that who you are is beyond that feeling? Who you are is more than any singular feeling. And that that feeling is not the totality of who you are. Good, good. So you can open your eyes and just very quick feedback. Anybody want to share an observation of the difference between the two? Ready? Yes. Yeah. It's very heavy holding that up. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Interesting. Perfect way, perfect metaphor. A wash of energy came my direction. Because if we're doing this experientially, although there's energy interchanging all the time for real, experientially we feel an obstacle because we're imagining what's between me and that energy. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? I, I just not, the rest of the world. not the rest of the world. Right, Emily, right. 
we're telling ourselves the stories. The world isn't really telling the stories about us very much, unless when they say there's that story about us, we really listen, it's their story about themselves. So we're all telling ourselves stories about ourselves. Yes? Beautiful. This requires a lot of attention, which actually robs you or hijacks your attention or your openness from the rest of life. This is the book. Basically, I call it five keys for unlocking success and consciousness. The joy of living. Basically, listen to where you resonate with happiness and joy. If it's petting dogs, great. That's mine in New York City. That's a big deal because there's so many dogs. I get to go, ah, a moment. Ah, you know, it's a real pleasure. So I consciously say, where's my next dog? Really, in New York City. So what is the joy that is your joy? There are many of them, so become awake to them and live with them. Choose your life team. What it means is be conscious of the company you keep. If the company you keep continues to negate life, if you feel that energy from them, be aware. Have honest conversations with them. And if it feels appropriate to move on, then you move on with love as best you can. And I will promise you that if, you eyes start, if your eyes start looking out without a lot of the old stuff, there will be other eyes that go, oh, that's nice. Hi, how are you? And you'll find others that resonate where you are now. Uh, find stillness beyond thinking. Whatever practice you need, really be serious about giving yourself some time to do that. Each day if you want, but some time. Because in the silence is where the nourishment is. The mind isn't the nourishment. Taste the quantum soup. In quantum physics, there's a term called quantum soup because elements are constantly and infinitely changing. So this moment, watch carefully. I do this, I do it again, I'm lying. I didn't do it again. Molecules, skin cells, things are different between the first and the second. But in the mind, we repeat as if it's fixed. There's nothing in here fixed. Ever was, never will be. So quantum soup is the idea that in this moment I looked at you before, and so I'm going to reproject onto you what I thought from before, but if I don't do that, there's quantum soup of possibility. Who are you right in this second? <laughs> and then it's fun. It's like... Certainly not the person I was a second ago. No, exactly. I'm in agreement. Air five. Nice. <laughs> it's nice you can do it from across the room. Air five. Emily, air five. Nice. And last is live beyond war. Live beyond war. I worked um, in an organizational part, uh, department of the United Nations where the, about 40 leaders of the UN's um, disseminating the funds in different countries were in the room and we were working on this kind of thing. And I had a couple people speak up. And one was someone that had to work in uh, one of the countries in Africa and he, he had an office, a UN office, and they were deciding how to use the funds, et cetera. But the problem was, and this is where he had to live beyond war because the circumstances certainly were warlike, he had people in his office of warring tribes. So in other words, those tribes may have killed each other's families. How does, a, in, in, this, in this case, we were dealing with leadership, how does someone stand, or you can with friends or with yourself, stand in a circumstance that's so laden with what the world is used to? And how do you stand holding open the possibility of beyond that conflict over and over again? It's a serious question. Right? It's not philosophical, it's experiential. How do you stand in your own two feet in that circumstance? Do you bring your wars in and project them? <coughs> Or do you stand as, in this story, remember the speaker? Presence was over here, waiting. You know, are you presence or are you more war? So the ocean of now in my talk today is really about the practice. Not the practice of just this meditation or just this physical yoga. I suggest all of that. But the idea of this whole conference about consciousness, the nature of consciousness. What I would end my talk with is the nature of consciousness is you looking through your eyes with as little filters as possible. 
That's the nature of consciousness. It's not a concept we can discuss. It's not an item or a, or a philosophy. It's your reality looking through with as little filters as possible. Then you become consciousness as unfiltered as possible. That's my take on it. And I'm going to end with, um, with a joke. Um, because I believe laughter is very important and very profound. What? And this is my favorite joke of all time, so no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh meter. Um, so in Kentucky, you know, the rhythms are kind of slow. <laughs> I have a friend from Texas back there. He's going, yeah, where are you going with this? <laughs> Rhythms are a little slower, right? So in a bar, two guys are having a drink, and this woman at a table nearby starts choking on a sandwich. And, and one of the guys saunters over, and he leans down and goes, excuse me, ma'am, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but can you swallow her? <laughs> She's going, uh, 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 huh. I, mean, I apologize, I don't mean to overstay my welcome, but can you breathe? Uh, uh, she's turning blue, right? So he walks behind her, and he lifts up her dress, and he lowers her drawers, and he licks her on her right butt cheek. She is violently repulsed and spits out the sandwich. <laughs> and he walks back over to the bar. He takes a sip, and his friend leans over and goes, you know, I had heard of that there hind leg maneuver. I'd never seen it done. I just ain't never seen it done. So in these, in these like 10 seconds of, right, pouring laughter and chemicals running through the body. You know what just happened? The mind just shut down. We were just laughing. Right? That's the other thing. If you look beyond filters, you're just here. Laughing comes easier. I will say from experience in my life, lightness comes easier. Play becomes easier. If you can do anything with your body to move it, to do five rhythms dancing or ecstatic dance or yoga, dancing yoga or whatever you want, if you can do anything to wake it up, it will be an essential part of your, your own awakening self journey. Because this is where we live the awakening of who we are, right? In the body. So when you see me doing all this, it's been exactly, don't stop. <laughs> so my, my motto and my ending of this, of this conversation is really have fun, love yourselves, lower your filters as best you can and experience who you really are in daily life. So thank you all, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.